So just a quick demonstration of uh, RSI and uh, the process that we want you to go through uh, when you're going to intubate someone. So the first thing you question you want to ask yourself when you're going to intubate a patient is are they currently oxygenating and ventilating? So uh, we need to look first at uh, do we have adequate minute volume? Uh, if they don't have adequate minute volume, then we need to provide positive pressure ventilation. And if they don't have adequate oxygenation, we need to be thoughtful about how we can best pre-oxygenate uh, high flow oxygen, sit them up uh, 20 degrees, and maybe add some uh, PEEP uh, to your bag valve mask. Once your patient's oxygenating well, um, or you've done everything that you could do to oxygenate them uh, besides intubation, uh, then uh, we're going to identify that we are indications for intubation. So we want to be thoughtful of um, uh, does a patient uh, have uh, inadequate gas exchange? Uh, are they failing to protect their airway? Um, are, are they, uh, is there a need to be able to obtain and maintain their airway uh, 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 in the case of uh, some sort of obstruction in their upper airway or, or something where you need to capture their airway now? Or what is the predicted clinical course? And predicted clinical course is a really good thing to think about uh, and whether or not the patient needs um, to uh, be intubated now or if that can be something that can wait until they get to the emergency department if they require other treatments that are there, for example, a trauma patient or something. So once you've identified that you have a patient that you want to intubate, uh, you're going to assess, uh, you're going to look externally, any obvious trauma, uh, abnormalities of the face, uh, narrow uh, jaw. Uh, then we're gonna measure, uh, evaluate 332. Uh, so we're going to assess the, based off the size of the patient's fingers whether or not we think we can fit three fingers uh, th uh, in their mouth. He's got two fingers. He's got three here. He's a bit one and a half down and he can sublux his jaw. Um, uh, at Mal and Patty, we're not going to be able to see, but we can have a visualization and see if we can view any structures in the posterior pharynx and try to judge size of tongue to size of mouth. Um, if the patient's able to cooperate, then we'd absolutely get them to go ah and give us and assess their malentati. Um, uh, obesity or obstruction, <clears throat> we uh, are uh, noting whether or not we have any upper airway obstruction or obesity, which this patient has none. Uh, and neck mobility, we want to see that the patient can assume sniffing position. Uh, once uh, we've gone through lemon, uh, then we need to go through and see what our backup plans are going to look like. Uh, we're using uh, boots, uh, so whether or not we have a beard, uh, if they're an older patient, have obesity, um, uh, if they're toothless, or have any adventitious sounds, snoring, stride, or anything like that. This patient has none of those, and we're pretending that I have a partner here that's currently pre-oxygenated with the bag valve mask, and I've got my peep valve on and my reservoir bag that's not there but is. Um, so they're oxygenated appropriately. And so I feel like bag valve mask will continue. Then turning our thoughts to extraglottic, whether or not, uh, so we'll think of a restricted mouth opening, um, any upper uh, obstruction uh, in the airway um, uh, or any obesity, um, any distortion of the lower airway uh, or any tight lungs. Uh, and then uh, DART, uh, any distortion over the surgical airway site? Can we put our finger on the anatomy? And do we have history of any tumors or radiation over that area? So given my assessments, we feel like a uh, patient is both a candidate uh, that I feel like I can intubate this patient and that if I fail, I have both a bag valve mask, uh, extraglottic, and surgical airway if required, uh, that I feel confident that I'm able to go through that. Uh, my patient's now pre-oxygenated. Uh, I'm going to make sure I uh, prepare my equipment and go through my plan. So I'm going to haul out my intubation qu uh, kit. I'm going to go through stop IC bars. <coughs> so stop, uh, so stylet and tube. So I'm going to take uh, appropriate size tube and a solid and one size smaller. We'll check the cuff and see if the cuff is actually nice and intact, which it is. We can leave the syringe attached. Put in a stylet into the the airway it's uh, or into the tube and bending at a nice uh, angle that I want. So stylet uh, suction. I've got suction under the patient's head. Um, uh, available to me uh, as I need it. We have our tube already. Oxygen's connected. We need to grab a nasal cannula so we can do uh, apneic oxygenation while we're intubating our patient. So we'll have that in the patient's nose to remind us when we take the bag valve mask off their face. 
<clears throat> that we're going to need this and he doesn't have ears so it won't really stay but we'll say that our nasal cannula is on our patient. So uh, oxygen pharmacology, uh, we're going to uh, be thinking in a use of RSI in this case. Uh, so we're going to use 1.5 milligrams per kilogram of ketamine with 1.5 milligrams per kilogram of succinylcholine. Let's say this patient's 70 kilogram patient, uh, 1.5 kilograms, so we are 105 milligrams and uh, can supplied in 50 micrograms per mil, or 50 milligrams per mil, so 2.1 mils. Um, and the same will be for succinylcholine. It's also 1.5 milligrams per kilogram and supplied in 50 milligrams per mil in our bags here at the college. So I'm going to drop my drugs. Uh, <clears throat> so we're drawing up 2.1 mils, which is going to contain a one, 100, 105 milligrams, so two point, and we'd have gloves and a pay, appropriate safety uh, stuff on. So we got two point one. I should have grabbed some smaller syringes. You'll forgive me if I'm using tens. Uh, a three mil syringe would be a much better option. And then we'll drop. Oh, we'll drop our. So 2.1-ish in a 10 mil syringe, which is an ideal. So please grab your 3 mil syringe. So I'll label my drugs, uh, set them there, then I'm re ready. So I have my uh, st um, stop done. I've got my IVs and connection. I'd want uh, SBO2, uh, CO2 into my stack already. If you have entitled CO2, or if you're using colometric, have it there to confirm with. Uh, so we'll pull over that, our confirmation, our Tumi syringe, and our, uh, our CO2 detector. Um, and then we're going to go through our uh, bars, uh, so our plan. So we're going to say to my partner, uh, we have a uh, patient, we're going to go through, and if I'm going to go in with direct laryngoscopy first, with a curved blade, if the curved blade, uh, this Macintosh um, 3 doesn't work, uh, then I have a, a, a Miller, uh, a large Miller blade here that I'll get you to hand to me. Um, I'm going to work my way down, try to find the epiglottis and get into the, um, engage the hyoepiglottic ligament. If I'm unsuccessful in that and getting a good view, I may ask for burp and uh, have you assisted uh, with by manual as well. Make sure your partner. If that doesn't work, then we're going to, uh, uh, if I can have at least a grade three view, then I'll try intubating with the bougie. And if that doesn't work, I'm going to come out and use an alternate blade. I'll also pull out my air track, which I don't have in this bag, so I can have an alternate intubation device and make sure that my assistant is familiar with all of those uh, instruments. So um, I've now gone through uh, my uh, bars, my alternate blades, uh, my rescue airway I need. If uh, intubation fails, I need you to watch the oxygen saturations partner. And if intubation fails, um, uh, or if sats uh, dip down to 92%, I'd like you to let me know and we're going to just declare failed intubation and uh, then try inserting a King LT. Uh, the King LT I'm going to size with a size 5, inflate the cuff, make sure that it's all ready to go if you need it. I, I can set, I'll keep that right here and I have my surgical airway in view. So uh, if the King LT is not successful, then we'll try the bag valve mask with two-person technique. Uh, and OPAs and NPAs. I have my NPAs right here uh, so that if we need them, they're right here and the OPA is uh, already in the patient. And if that's not successful, then we'll have to go to the surgical airway, which is there. Uh, so we'll confirm that our patient's oxygenation is good, get another uh, blood pressure wherever IV running, and uh, make sure that uh, we've pre-oxygenated for at least three minutes. Uh, patients at the top of the bed, uh, they don't have any indications for C-spine, um, uh, so uh, I, I, don't, I can manipulate their head wherever I'd like. I can use a sniffing position. Uh, lovely. So we're now at the point that we can push our drugs. Uh, so I'll pull 
my, uh, my ketamine. I'm just going to confirm once again my sats, encourage my partner that's going to be still at the head bag valve masking, not to uh, take the bag valve mask off the patient's face because uh, I don't until we're sure the patient's apneic and just wait till I get to the head. So I'm going to push uh, my ketamine first uh, and in goes my ketamine into my patient's IV. So in goes ketamine, in goes our succinylcholine. I'm going to come to the head and take over my bag valve mask for my uh, partner. I'm going to remind them at this point when I'm standing at the head, uh, when we switch, when I take the bag valve mask off, can you please switch over the D cylinder over to the high flow nasal uh, so that uh, we can take advantage of some apneic oxygenation. Let's say that I see fasciculations uh, at 30 seconds later uh, and I feel loosening of the patient's jaw. I'm going to set uh, my bag valve mask down and take the OPA out of the patient's mouth, uh, lay them down where at a good level where I feel like I'm comfortable. I'm going to take my laryngoscope. I'm going to advance my way down from the right hand side of the mouth, working my way over until I can see the epiglottis. Once I can see the epiglottis, I'm going to try to engage the hyoepiglottic ligament. And uh, then I'm going to get my assistant to pass me my tube. Um, then you're going to advance your endotracheal tube. When your tip of the tube is into the glottic opening, uh, we'll want to have your partner take the stylet back uh, about 10, 5 centimeters, 8 centimeters, um, so that we can advance the endotracheal tube into position. We'll also look and see that we can actually bounce the tube around inside the vocal cords and that we're actually seeing it in the glottic opening. Once we're inserted to the vocal cord marking, uh, we're gonna come out, turn our blade off, we'll take our stylet out, <clears throat> we'll inflate our cuff. Our first breath uh, with our partner bagging will be through our CO2 de detector and we'll make sure that we have CO2. Uh, so we'll say my partner's bagging, okay? I know that's hard to see. So while my partner holding this tube really well and, uh, and well and holding their other hand on the bag valve mask, I'll just tell them I'm just gonna grab my stethoscope and they can bag and we'll see CO2 changes on the, on the van mannequin and do I see, do I hear equal chest rise and fall, which I do. So I hear equal chest rise and fall throughout. I have CO2 detection. I'm also going to take my Tumi syringe. So I'll just get my partner to take the bag valve mask off for a second. Attach my Tumi syringe to the tube itself. Pull back. See that I have no negative pressure. Uh, so then I can detach that and put this in. And then we'll uh, hold this and we can secure our tube with our tube holder that we have there. Now is a great time to recheck your vital signs, see that your blood pressure is still stable, see what your SBOT is, and see what your CO2 is at present, and make sure to set a good ventilatory rate, uh, not hi to hyperventilate the patient. Um, uh, the things that we're concerned post is that we want to monitor sedation, and watch for heart rate, and watch SBO2. Remember with the oxygenation that we've provided, uh, that uh, SATs could remain up for a long time, uh, if we're actually not in the trachea. So be aware of that if you have desaturations in the first minutes post intubation, you may have never been in the trachea and thought that you were. Um, so there's a quick demonstration of uh, intubation using RSI. <laughs> 